Hey everyone, uh, I'm going to do something a little bit different today, so um, when I'm not gaming, one of the things I like to do is art, which is actually what my degree was in way, way back in the day. Um, and one of the things I was known for, sort of in the, I'd say, early 2000s, was uh, doing artwork for um, Dark Sun Online. Uh, which was kind of a group of people trying to keep the D and D TSR game World of Dark Sun alive. Uh, when, um, when I believe it was Wizkids, when they took over uh, TSR, they went ahead and they kind of dumped that game world. Which I can I can see why uh, Dark Sun was one with kind of mature themes. Is actually what drew me and a lot of other people to it. Um, it's a post-apocalyptic world where the bad guys won. And that's really its claim to fame is that uh, when you do something heroic in Dark Sun, it really, really matters because you're one person against a system as opposed to being in a world where the bad guy is the anomaly and you've got to confront the anomaly and you have like a whole society at your back. In Dark Sun, it's the other way around, that the society that you're fighting against is often insurmountable, so the little actions you take as a hero are actually what define it. So uh, drawing characters and monsters for that world for years, and then uh, Athos.org uh, went ahead and started rolling out their version of uh, Dark Sun 3.0, and they needed somebody to draw a whole bunch of monsters for them. So, uh, over the span of about a uh, summer, so about three to four months, I went ahead and rolled out probably around 200 monster drawings or something like that. So if you go out and you find the, uh, the monster document for Dark Sun for 3.0 or 3.5, you'll typically find a bunch of my drawings. Or if you look up Dark Sun monsters, you'll, you'll probably find a few of my drawings up top, maybe even over... Uh, Brahmer Boxes, who are the official artists for the Dark Sun world, at least in the first iterations. Um, as you can tell from the drawing that's up there, that's just a digital sketch right now, uh, I tend to work pencil and paper. I'm trying to get better at digital artwork just because um, a little easier to save and make changes if I don't like something. Like if I get deep into a drawing and I'm kind of like, uh, I should have moved that like two inches to the left or I don't like the way that's centered. You got to start drawing it again. And sometimes you come up with something better. Sometimes you don't. It's hard to capture the magic twice if you get something you really like. Um, but this kind of brings me to now. Uh, over the last few years, probably the last like three decades, really, D&D uh, &D is a great system gary gygax when he came up with it he is a very good world builder uh which i know there's some controversy out there over where he got some of his ideas but um he was very good at building worlds unfortunately he was not as good at building uh rule systems and the problem is is that to stay loyal to that rule system D, &D every time they roll out a new version they just try to keep iterating on a bad design. And it was probably about 15 to 20 years ago I started saying, you know, Dark Sun really isn't the, or not Dark Sun, D&D uh, &D served the D20 system with a whole bunch of different dice representing all the different um, damage types and rolls and all that. It's not really... A great system it's kind of cumbersome it's hard to pick up it's not very intuitive sometimes you gotta roll high sometimes you gotta roll low um so i started looking at other game systems and i mean of course like all nerds i had played a bunch of different game systems so i mean i kind of had some sort of a base to go with and i knew kind of what i was looking for um and so i eventually settled on a percentage based system so it's generally pretty easy if you're um whether you're a new player or an old player, if you have a 20% chance of doing something, it makes sense that, you know, you 
you have to roll 20% or higher to actually achieve the thing. And that's kind of the system that settled in on my brain. And then COVID hit, I got a bunch of free time. And uh, one of the things I decided to do was um, kind of gather up all the notes that I've been making over the years and actually make my own gaming system. And the first uh, iteration of that I wanted to be was uh, Dark Sun. Now, since Dark Sun is trademarked and copyrighted, um, of course, I can't actually sell this game. It, it has to be in the realm of uh, fan fiction as far as copyright is concerned. So I can't, I can't make a profit on it at all. It's, it's got to be completely free. And so you'll actually find it in the... I'll put a link to the base PDF down below. Uh, but one of the things I'm doing now that I have kind of finished writing it and the first uh the first edits on it um still needs to be cleaned up a little bit but now i want to start going through and making all the art for it and since i wrote about 700 pages worth of uh sort of sites locations history character building uh rules um there's going to be quite a bit of art to it so my goal uh, is to go ahead and kind of record making at least some of the pictures of the art that's going to go in there. And these aren't going to be the big, complicated pieces. Um, so when you're making a book, you have a uh, double-page spread, which is, I'll take off my little art glove here. Um, so on a book, you have a page. A uh, double-page spread is when both pages are together, so they fold out in the book. That's a double-page spread, just across both of them. Uh, the way that TSR does it, or did it uh, with Planescape and Dark Sun and most of their books is they would try to have at least one piece of art per double page spread. And sometimes you'd have a large piece that would go across multiple pages. So what I'm doing here, these are going to mostly be smaller, just kind of character or setting shots, just something to kind of get a feel for the world, the characters. Um, just kind of the setting in general. And so you can see here, I've got a couple of Asian Aarakocra, which are uh, different from others. Typically, these are the birdmen, but on Athos, they are more uh, vultures. And, um, or they look more like vultures than eagles. So obviously, I'm working off of vultures here and pull up a few reference images. Um, but these are going to be relatively quick sketches. That's the goal is to just kind of get an idea across more than the Mona Lisa. I'm not trying to make something that will go down in all time as one of the great artworks of Americana or whatever. This is just a kind of someone glances at it and that's the idea. Uh, so you, you might hear me... Um, if you ever talk to me in person, you might hear me occasionally rip on uh, Boxa, who is a very, very well-known artist. Um, but he, if you played any game, especially in the 90s, um, he was the artist for a lot of different ones like Shadowrun and Dark Sun, I'm sure others. Uh, but he was a volume guy, so he would do things like this, and he was very good at it. Like, he could probably you'd see probably three quarters of the artwork in there would be box art. It's because he was very good at just kind of rolling out at least good art. Like it, it wouldn't be like Brahm where each one is kind of a unique work of art that you look at and you're like, wow, that's good. Or Dieter Lisi, Tony Dieter Lisi is another one that you'll obviously see had a lot of influence on me. Um, but Unlike those guys where each one you wouldn't mind having on your wall box, it was more just trying to get across a theme or an idea. And I'm going to try to land somewhere in between. Um, so these you can sort of see with this, uh, my normal inclination would be to go much further on this, that these would typically take a week or two. Uh, but on these drawings that I'm going to whip out here, probably I'm hoping at least one to 200 of them. That'll just be these really quick character drawings. 
Uh, if they're taking me more than an hour, I am probably not doing it right. Of course, at first, I'm going to be moving a little bit slow just because that's the nature of the beast when I'm trying to relearn all this stuff that I knew from ages ago on digital artwork. Um, and so with that lead in done, I am just going to go ahead and start sketching. If you want to follow along, uh, that's great. Um, the I will talk when I see something interesting happening or when I'm trying to sort of think through something. Um, with this sketch, I've already kind of got it going, so it's not going to be too difficult, but you can pretty much just ignore me down the corner here. You're mostly going to see this because I'm looking at my little um, screen that's sitting in my lap right now. Um, and eventually I'll, I'll get my, uh, my Cintiq. I have a, a bigger one on a monitor, but I currently don't have an arm for it on this setup, so I really want to get the setup going for it start recording on that. So there's a little bit smaller screen than I'm used to too. Uh, so I'm just going to get going and um, I'll try to talk about happy little trees and stuff like that. Uh, so one of the ways that I work is I like to use swatches. Uh, generally this just means um, with the HSB because you can actually control like uh, the color. It's being a little twitchy right now. But you can go to like what shade you want, you can go towards how dark or light you want it to be, and then you can go by the hue up here. But I, I tend to uh, tend to go as dark as possible. I might have to reset that, and then I set my opacity down a little bit when I'm doing this kind of work. And you can sort of see that I went for uh, almost like a brush there. And this is what I mean by kind of an influence of Dieter Lisi, as you'll notice on the back of his. I'm not sure if he was a digital painter or if he actually worked in watercolor, but the effect is that it came off looking like watercolor, uh, which I always thought was kind of a neat effect and uh, wouldn't mind emulating that in this, obviously. Dieter Lisi being one of the ones that I like. Um, but yeah, I'm just going to get into this. I'm going to be playing music in the background, which will hopefully be muted, or this will be copyright striked and I'll be very sad because I will have just recorded all of that for nothing. Uh, but I work better when there's music playing. So um, enjoy me occasionally bobbing my head and the artwork coming ahead. Let's make some uh, happy Aarakocra eating a happy random desert monster. And no, I don't know what it is. It's just going to be um, a prig, something like that. Well, yeah. Let's let's just call it a random desert monster. They were hungry, and it was there, and it is mutated. But if I had its food, here we go. So one of the things I try to think of when I'm working my way through these, uh, especially being the writer on this document too, is try to give an idea for some of the things that don't always make sense. So the Aarakocra are bird people, and they have these, their arms are wings. And so when you've got giant wings, how would you do things like wear armor? Or um, they don't have ears, so would they have something else like uh, necklaces instead? So you can sort of see that I've got a necklace going on here. So what sort of thing would tribal Aarakocra have? Maybe feathers, claws, something like that. Uh, would they have facial pain? And so we can kick that up a little bit. Just kind of do little things to give them some personality and just kind of give, really the goal here is to give uh, players some ideas. Uh, while making their characters, they just want to have something to build off of. Oh, that's a good idea. I want my character to be like this drawing and then they can show it. And 
everyone's on the same page. Because, I mean, anything that I can do to help people visualize the story that they're trying to tell, that's kind of the goal of this kind of art in role-playing games in general, is we're all just there to tell a story. So that's a little bit darker than I like. So I'm going to knock that down to about 30%. Um, so the way that I think Eric or Armour would work is they would probably have something that loops around their neck and then comes down this way and loops into something around their waist. And so it would protect. They're probably not worried about anything attacking them from above because they're they're flyers if anything is above them they're they're already in trouble so their concern would be creatures from below them humanoids probably more than anything seeing them and actually firing up at them and of course they're intelligent creatures and they do regularly deal with humans so i figure they would have things like water skins and things like that that they would regularly make use of but also trying to think your way through their musculature like do they have a regular rib cage or would it be more like a bird's rib cage like what what do they look like and how do things work because that's kind of one of those things as an artist here and as a storyteller i'm trying to say this is a creature that could actually exist. And then somebody would actually be able to take that as an idea. And that is a bit of a big eraser and say, this is what my character looks like. And all of this makes sense. And I'm happy with that. And if I've done that, then I'm doing my job. Now I need to go a little bit darker because I want this to really stand out. So this is the, uh, they're kind of unique in the sense that because they're, they're flying, they use their feet more than their hands, which they're using to fly with. They're not septopods. They don't have six limbs. They only have four. So they'll tend to use their legs in the ways that we would use our hands, but they also have little tiny hands, little fingers hanging off of their wings. And so you can sort of see I'm working on that concept down here. So they've got this thumb and these little fragile, and I really do want these things to look sort of weak. Um, I never want an Eric Hawker player out there saying, yeah, my beefy fighter Aarakocra is definitely going to attack that bear and come out on top. I want him to kind of look at this and be like, ooh, I'm kind of spindly and fragile. And so that's what I'm going to go with with this. Is try to make him look kind of delicate, but tough enough that someone would actually want to play him. Uh, one of the things I kind of examined when coming up with these and when you see when i'm working on uh terexes uh which are what terrans ride they're kind of huge pterodactyls one of the things i'm basing that on is um the uh quetzalcoatl uh which was a giant dinosaur uh pterosaur that um was about the same size and kind of similar shape to a giraffe uh, very large, they think predators, very good flyers, but I'm kind of using um, a similar muscular structure here with the Aarakocra, uh, just to kind of explain how they could move. And again, just kind of working quick here, the goal is not to make something that is hugely complex it's just to get the idea across because this will probably be a relatively small piece of art on the page um so 
if I'm making something very huge and detailed here, it's, it's going to get lost when I print it anyway. That is as small as I get. Okay, that's fine. Another thing about Dark Sun is that there's not a lot of metal. So when you lack metal, you really lack tools to make a lot of things that you kind of take for granted. Um, and that kind of makes it fun as an artist because you have to start thinking, okay, well, obviously this guy isn't going to have like a bunch of metal daggers and stuff hanging off him. Most everything you have is going to be some iteration on leather or cloth or bones, um, items like that. And so the idea is to go ahead and kind of incorporate that in here. And again, it goes back to telling that story, getting characters or players who are getting ready to play in this world kind of prepared, kind of set their brain to say, oh, right, yeah, so how would this thing that I normally have in other game systems, what would that be in Dark Sun? Like, uh, there, there aren't really good knives. I'm using something like a stone knife to make a uh, this or that. So what would that product that I'm building finally be like? Another trick is making sure that you actually get personality in there because these are humanoid player character creatures. If people can't relate to what you're drawing, no one's going to want to be that character. They're just going to sort of say, oh, those are cool. And then you'll just end up with a character kind of honestly like dwarves that just always end up as NPCs because nobody wants to play them because they... They don't seem interesting enough. They aren't relatable enough. Like dwarves, especially in Dark Sun, are just incredibly stubborn, which is kind of a cool character concept in like a story. Uh, but the number of people that actually want to play as and play with a character that's incredibly stubborn and obnoxiously, obsessively so. That's a small group of people. I won't say it'll never happen, but, uh, yeah, just, you kind of have to be a little bit careful in character design because of that. So you want to make groups like that appealing despite their idiosyncrasies. And so what I'm trying to do right now is kind of think of since the Aarakocra use their legs as I'm going to try to make them look really thin here. How would the anatomy of that work? And honestly, I'm kind of faking it here. Um, that making the, the leg look a little bit more dexterous, which is kind of what they're known for. and honestly disguising a little bit what's going on and again that's kind of an advantage of a gesture drawing like this is that since i'm going fast no single part of it will matter so when i pull back on this um it's 
So when you pull back far enough, it's not as obvious what's going on. Your brain just kind of sees this shape, and it's kind of like, oh, okay, I get it. It's holding a spear. You're not actually glancing at it and being like, how would that torque the hip and work that way? And granted, somebody will eventually look close, especially since I'm making a video on this, and say, well, that doesn't make any sense. This guy's a terrible artist, and yeah. So now I'm going to go a little bit bigger here. I'm going to go much fainter, because I'm going to do sort of the same thing I did over here. Let's just add in a little bit of color. Since they're buzzard-like creatures, they're... Uh, They've got this white frill, and then the rest of them is kind of dark. Although, I uh, might play around with that a little bit in other drawings of Eric Okra, which I do kind of want to have a fair number of drawings, because everybody knows what a human looks like. You don't want to know what the human looks like. Uh, you, as a person, you know what the human culture is, because you're a human, at least. I hope you are. Um, otherwise this is a very awkward conversation. Uh, but the point is to kind of get the more non-human races in there and so that people can make a relatable story and be like, oh, so they work like this or that or whatever. So one of the things I'm now seeing is that he doesn't have tail feathers. So you can see this one's got tail feathers over here. I kind of like that. I don't want them to be really high detail, but just kind of enough to catch people's eye. I really want that beak and the head to stand out. Um, so the goal is to kind of make a triangle. Um, here, I'll, I'll throw on a new layer. I'll kind of show you what I'm trying to do here stylistically. So, um, go ahead and get rid of that. Pop my colors back out. So, what I kind of want to do is make a triangle like this that your eye is primarily drawn to. Uh, and one of the reasons I always try to put some sort of triangle in... Um, at least at least one triangle in my compositions just because your eye will naturally sort of circulate to these three areas and the more your eyes circulate between different points on the image regardless of how good the image is it will appear more interesting to your brain and so i want you kind of swinging through the picture going oh that's kind of cool um, and then you kind of have places that the eye can go to rest. So you have things over here, over here. I'm going to kind of build that in here too. And maybe just little areas where you can go where your eye can just kind of relax rather than, oh my God, 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 oh my God. And yeah, no, nobody wants to do that. Where some people do. Hey, I'm not going to kink shame. So let's drag that out of there uh, and keep going with this idea. Um, so this one's this one's getting pretty good. This is what I mean by quick drawings, is that I just kind of want to bust these out. This will be something sitting down in the corner of a page. So it's not quite in the margins, but um, it's not meant to be a centerpiece. It's not supposed to be the thing that you're focusing on the page. You're supposed to be reading and kind of glance, go, oh, that's a cool picture, turn the page. Um, if you're seeing you're like studying the picture in depth, I've probably screwed up or i'm really good i don't know we'll go with that one i like that one better so i'm going to put a little bit more detail into this so you can sort of see i've already kind of blocked it in on my rough drawing here uh, where i've kind of put in ideas different things so this is the large two-handed spear that eric cocker will kind of use you can see that these are more darts that uh this Eric Cocker was using these darts, so it probably got the kill hit. Uh, but Eric Cocker, also known for using these gigantic spears, just dropping from a high height and hitting people with these massive, thick spears. And so that's what this is here, is one of those. And so I'm going to 
back in a little bit of detail with a uh, with the eraser just to kind of give it a little bit of a highlight. This is just a little bit of push pull. Okay, 14 is probably a little bit too light. And let's go there. And again, this is where things get kind of interesting because with Dark Sun, you're dealing with a bunch of non metal components. So typically, in most worlds, the shaft would be metal, the blade would be metal, how the blade was held to the shaft would be metal. In Dark Sun, you don't have any of that. And so all of this has got to be, I, one of the things I'm trying to do is kind of conceptually make it so that you can look at it and be like, oh, they're using this material and that material. And so in this case, obviously, you'd mostly be holding it together with leather. There's not a whole lot of wood on Dark Sun, but there's some on Athos. The planet is called Athos. Um, so you can sort of see, okay, they're making a wrap here. They're wrapping it around the blade in places, and that's how it works. And obviously, I'm going to go through and make the blade itself very kind of rough hewn. So it's obvious it's not metal, it's some other material. It's probably stone or carved bone or something like that, but it's, it's not going to be a steel blade because that would make it so valuable you wouldn't take it out on a hunt. You might use it in war, uh, but you're, you're not going to use it unless your life is absolutely in danger because it's so valuable. And then just putting little spikes on there. And of course, since this is, since they're tribal communities, uh, weapons would probably kind of hold a special importance to them. So, once again, you kind of put little decorations on here. And so, are they feathers? Are they claws? Anything like that? Point is to leave it a little bit ambiguous here so that people could draw their own conclusions. Probably feathers because they're bird people. Um, but also, uh, feathers would be a little bit easier and a little bit lighter than claws would be. And so now I'm just going to kind of go through and put in a couple of details here. But now you kind of get the idea by, of what I'm saying when I'm saying make these quick. So the goal is to make really quick just gestures of what I think that this would look like. And just kind of tell a really short, quick story with the art. All right, so now we got to do this little critter. Um, so this is one of the areas that uh, Boxa was, uh, as a fellow GM, both infuriating and awesome, was he would always put, like, just the weirdest crap in the background of his drawings, or even in the foregrounds. So, like, you'd be looking at something that's supposed to be a uh, human, and it would have, like, a horn coming out of its nose or it would have six arms or whatever and it was just kind of I don't care sure here you go just feel like drawing some of six arms today which I can totally get behind sometimes um but yeah yeah it's kind of I'm now doing the same thing so thanks boxa channeling you on this one um at least on this little critter down here so uh, I don't want to make this critter too sympathetic. Um, so I might come through and put through a couple little sharp teeth here to make it look like it, it deserved this. But in reality, I mean, you do what you got to do to survive, right? Just kind of the point. So obviously there's going to be probably a reptilian creature. Uh, so just kind of modeling up the skin here. It's got these giant claws, so I'm thinking it's probably some sort of burrower. And honestly, one of the benefits of being the uh, the writer of this particular version, as well as being the artist, is that I can swing back and be like, 
I really liked that weird whatever the hell it was I drew back in the Eric Cochran drawing. What if I were to make that an actual critter? What would that be like? What would it do? And so right now, just kind of thinking on that, it's got these long claws. Um, so it might make sense that it was some sort of burrower. So I could actually make these claws a little bit blunter, just kind of make its feet very thick. And I mean, anything on Athos is capable of defending itself. So these would be pretty formidable, uh, even if it was a, uh, even if it's an herbivore, which this, this almost certainly is. So yeah, maybe I won't give it sharp teeth. Um, and of course the, other point that I kind of want to get across with this is that Dark Sun is ha pretty harsh, and so maybe this creature is starving too. So, I mean, it makes a meal for these creatures, but or for the air cockroach, but um, not a very long one because you're not going to get a lot of food off of this thing. You're going to be out there hunting again because this is mostly going to be rough hide and bone. So it's always important to kind of keep an eye on a on basic anatomy. When you start straying too far off of anatomy, it starts to lose its relatability and it starts to feel um, much less realistic. And you have to watch that. There's kind of an uncanny valley level in uh, fantasy where sometimes you push things intentionally to make them disturbing to look at like demons and things like that you'd want to give them some features that are distinctly inhuman so that they're disturbing to look at but in this case this is supposed to be a natural animal so you would very much want it to be something of oh it is like a cow like a pig even though it looks completely different you can understand its anatomy and its role in the world without having to think too hard about it. Um, if people are spending a lot of time trying to think, well, how would that work? Why does it have udders on its back? And then you've screwed up as an artist. And so keep an eye on anatomy. Anatomy is always important. And so now I'm kind of trying to think, it's got this beefy front. Maybe it would have stocky legs. And would it have these big claws or would they be smaller? And I'm thinking I'm going to kind of go a little bit smaller on the back claws and just make them look more powerful rather than, uh, rather than looking like they were there to dig. And so you can sort of see my my gesture drawing down here um, looks one way, and I'm kind of diverging from that because now I've decided that this might make more sense, or at least look a little better. Could be totally wrong on that. I don't know. Sometimes you make mistakes. It's happy accents are definitely something that happens in art. And you can see I'm just kind of faking it in here. Um, but if I've done my job right, won't be overly obvious. And so the idea here that I'm going for is to kind of make it a little ambiguous whether this is some kind of weird mammal or whether it's a reptile. Uh, because mutation and a world that's off kilter is also a pretty strong theme in Dark Sun. And so coming up with something that just, it's not totally clear what it is and it kind of feels wrong without, without losing that sort of intrinsic 
trueness. That's kind of what I'm aiming for here. So once again, I'm getting a little bit of shading. Um, I don't want this to be as extreme. I want the Eric Ocker to read as, um, as darker than this. Uh, so I'm just adding a couple little shots here and there. Maybe that's a little bit too big. Just enough to kind of ground it and then just kind of put in a shadow just to make sure it's sitting on the ground. Just kind of do the same for the Eric Cocker themselves. Okay, so, so here's something else I need to go back and do. So one of the things I was thinking with here is since the Eric Cocker legs are more what they use as their arms, would that be where they have like their jewelry and their clothing and stuff like that? And so you can sort of see, I put a little thing on here and I don't need to go really overboard with this. I can just sort of have like little dots. It's obvious that something is there and leaving the viewer with something that they can fill in on their own makes it a little bit more personal. Um, so there's, there's benefits to not being super detailed with these. So, uh, I, I could go in and one of the ways that I used to paint and make drawings was, um, going with a 0 0.005 pen and, uh, Back when my eyes are much better, get like real close up to the page, and I'd be putting like tiny, tiny details on like coins and things like that. Which you can do. And there is a place for things like that. But in a drawing like this, the point is to kind of give the viewer some, just kind of give them something to view, uh, something to sort of put their own story into it. So now the question is, what was I thinking back here? That's the other wing. Okay, so I, I do know what I was thinking of doing here. So you can sort of see how the uh, how the Eric Cocker's hand kind of looks like that. And that's sort of, um, I'll pull it over here. So these two fingers actually spread out and make the rest of the wing, whereas these three fingers, it's got a thumb and two fingers, and that's how it kind of grabs things. They're not very strong, uh, probably pretty dexterous, but it's it's not like it's down there fighting with a two-handed sword that way. It, it would use its feet if it ever got in that situation, and it wouldn't. Um, but in this case, since it's landed and it's about to butcher this thing, I was thinking it would probably be cool to actually show how that little three-fingered hand would work and butchering this whatever the hell it is um, would probably be one of the ways it did it. And I can also kind of get a freebie in the sense that I can show how the hand works. Uh, so now I need to go in and let's see, yeah, 50. Should be good, so we'll just go ahead and put their long kind of weird ass finger or thumb on there. Get that on there. Get that there. So I want the hand to stand out. And I want this blade to stand out. So once again, you kind of got the weird handle, and you're gonna have this probably obsidian blade here. So I'm going to make that a little bit darker. Go through with the eraser and pick up an edge on it. And just a little bit more push and pull to kind of call it out. And it may not be obvious what is happening here. And that's kind of a goal on this is that it can be a little bit ambiguous what that is in the background. And I'm okay with that. Um, like if somebody looks at it and they say, I, I have no idea, maybe it's a wand or something, fine. Um, 
that's that's good. So again, they can kind of put their own view on it, even if they don't see that as a hand when they're looking at it at the scale that I'm thinking of, which is probably going to be, that's probably a similar scale, um, depending on the size of your monitor, obviously. Um, you'll probably have a full page up above, and then this will be sitting just kind of given the shape of it, uh, this will be sitting that kind of down in like one of the corners, one of the lower corners. And so it'll be thinking probably lower left uh, would make sense because it kind of cuts in here. So you'd have most of your writing. So that way you're not shoving the print either into the center of the double page spread where the binding is or throwing it off the page. You don't want to make it unpleasant to look at. Um, just holistically. You don't want the page of writing combined with the art to be unpleasant to look at. Uh, but one good thing, now I can start doing near far, where I can sort of see how this works from a distance. And right here, this area is starting to be problematic. It's it's not dark enough. It doesn't read well. This is pretty good. This is I'm I'm pretty happy with this. I might darken up a couple of the main lines. But this this isn't reading well enough. And so now I'm going to go in and darken that a little bit. And this one will probably be done. So I kind of want to put hit this with a little bit, not thicker line, but a darker line that just kind of stands out. And um, if you go through art classes, uh, one of the things they'll teach you is uh, don't feather your strokes. And what they're talking about, again, I'll uh, throw another line on here, um, or another layer. Uh, so let's say that you're going to draw a circle. Um, so this is just drawing a circle. Feathering is when you go like this, and you just kind of work it around with a bunch of little strokes, and then you draw a circle. They both get a circle. But this one reads is much stronger when you're further away, whereas the other one kind of looks like a fuzzy piece of crap. You you don't look like you're as sure um, with your strokes. And so it's typically better to, if possible, unless you're specifically trying to do something with... Oh, I guess I could just delete the whole layer. Uh, once again, benefit of... If they're doing it in Photoshop. Um, yeah, so I mean, one of one of the benefits of going with a strong line is that you use less information to tell the same story, and you generally want to do that. Um, the more a person is filling in information on their own, the more they're going to relate to the piece, and that's the goal especially with this. Sometimes it isn't, but in this case it is. Um, so now we're going to go ahead, get a little bit bigger brush. I don't want it to be that dark. Um, I might start messing with the brush types, uh, but for right now I'm trying to emulate what a pen would look like. Um, so I'm mostly just sticking to the regular brush here. Uh, so that's probably a bit too far out. I want to go right about here and start putting in shadows. Yeah, I, I, thanks Photoshop. I, I know what a brush is. So right here, I'm just trying to ground the Aarakocra and the uh, the creature just to kind of put it in the world. And so now the question is, do we want any details? Um, like little rocks or something like that? And I think we do. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to 
kick this up a little bit. Just kind of little things in the foreground just to kind of play around with. So once again, just using very quick strokes. Uh, I'm being really inconsistent with my lighting, which is not a good thing. Um, but in this case, I'm okay with it because this is going to be a very small image anyway. And also, since I'm not totally sure how it's going to fit on the page, I don't want to spend a lot of time on like building out a background or anything because I figure this is going to be just character art down the bottom. So it doesn't need to be anything spectacular. And wasting a bunch of time on something in the background would mean the more items I put up here, the less room that I have for text. And the more that this piece becomes a focus of the page. And there will be artwork that I work on in this project uh, that will fit into that role where the artwork is the focus and when you're ready to take a break from looking at the art you can read um this isn't one of those yeah uh, this and probably the next few where i'm just kind of getting my sea legs back under me are just going to be things like this where it's just sort of meant to be something quick dirty and that's it And never be afraid to show your work. So you can sort of see that there's things floating off in the background here. You can sort of see that there's mess there. Um, people get a little twitchy with their artwork sometimes. And they're kind of like, well, it's got to be perfect. It doesn't. Um, you'll, you'll see a lot of things where just sometimes the little mistakes are kind of what draw your eye in and make things interesting. Uh, blood. I forgot blood. Um, so obviously you hit something with a bunch of arrows like this. If it died, come here. You probably hit something vital. And if you hit something vital, You kind of got to think that the blood was flowing as it was running. So we can just kind of have all of this flowing. And it kind of helps define the shapes of whatever this creature is. So we maybe have a little trickle going off this side. Just kind of wrap it around there. Then pulling up around it. Water is precious on Athos, and life is short. So there's, when I was talking about happy accidents, didn't do this on purpose, but you can kind of see there's a little white spot right there. Kind of looks like a spike coming off an elbow a little bit. So I am going to go ahead and play with that a little bit. Pull that out. Once again, it's kind of a weird little, what the hell is that? That was a bit much, but. Take down the opacity on this a lot more than 100%. Yeah, that looks sufficiently weird. Okay. Now I'm just going to kind of go through and put a couple little details in here. I'm kind of debating this area up here on the ribs aren't quite where I want them. Um, but I'm pushing near my uh, limit for how long I want to work on these things. So I am going to call it here in a couple minutes. Regardless of whether I'm super happy with it or not, which is also a little bit of uh, just kind of staying true to my goals on this, that 
uh, one of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I was going through art school um, was um, one of my instructors, who's actually a grad student, uh, not a professor. Uh, she had this um, this exercise where she had us uh, do a still life, and my reputation on still lives was being like practically like a uh, a Denmark artist. Like it, it was really super detailed, and I would again sit there with a point zero zero five pen and get every single detail like i mean you could look at two different jars and be able to tell which one i drew because they'd be that detailed and so uh we worked on this still life for two days and then on the third day when we came in she said okay mike you're gonna hate me everybody hand your piece to the person to the left and do your style over the other person's artwork and so the guy who was sitting to my left uh really liked to work with charcoal and he liked to do big, broad gestures and stuff like this. And so, I mean, he looked at mine and he was just like, yes, and just started coloring all over. It. And she said, yeah, don't get precious with the mic. You know, sometimes you've, you've got to live with what's on the page and accept that that's what it's going to look like. And sometimes being loose with the drawing will benefit you more than being super tight with it. So, I mean, like right now, I'm just basically scribbling um but you can kind of see the effect that it's having right there is it is kind of giving this thing some neat texture that i wouldn't have if i were in there trying to draw like every single dot on this thing and so i think that might be where we call this one so let's take a look at it so i'm going to back off to a point where i can kind of see the whole composition here and just kind of see if I like the way that it's flowing. And so again, you can kind of see that triangle. So it, it ended up a little bit different than I intended. It seems like it's going more like this. But if you have more than one, like your your natural inclination just as an animal is going to be a focus on eyes. So I mean, naturally, you're going to start going between these two, especially since they almost seem to be looking at you as they killed this thing like uh you know try to take this thing from us buddy um or they're asking you to join in like do you want a fine cut of whatever the hell this thing is maybe uh but that's the idea and so i mean this rock down here look at it, it's just a couple scribbles but your eye is going to be more drawn to what's going on here and here, here, like what's going on with this hand. And um, that's kind of my goal. One of the things I'm not liking right now is that it kind of looks like this Aarakocra is putting out one of its legs and just kind of standing on it. And I don't like that. So I am going to delete that um, once again reason I am doing this in Photoshop is this is the kind of thing that had I done all of this in pen it would be damn near impossible to do this um, so I'm not going to completely blast it out of there you'll still be able to kind of see parts of it uh, but now I've kind of got this weird wing hanging out there and I'm going to go in and cure that by putting in the fingers um, but in this case, I'm just going to have the fingers kind of be relaxed. So it's kind of, it's done its thing. It threw its darts. He's good. So the fingers can just kind of be this loose gesture kind of out of focus. You can think of it that way. Um, and so how they'll read when we're back is like that. And so, yeah, I'm liking that. I still think the wing should sweep back a little more so make that a little bit bigger again I'm kind of making it a little bit lighter making sure that it follows through so that visually people can kind of read what's going on yeah I like that better um so we'll go with that sounds good
So I'm going to go ahead and throw my signature down in the corner, um, which is something that I used to hate doing. Um, I would never, in college, I would never name pieces or really sign things. I'd sign them on the back. Uh, and when I actually got to the point where I was selling art uh, a few years ago, people would actually get mad at me because they'd be like, no, I, w I want your signature on there. I want to know who did it. And I realized that um, it's not overly egotistical to point at something and say, I did that. So sign your work. So in this case, I'm just going to make it a little symbol. I'm not going to put a date on it. Um, but I will go ahead and put my signature on there. I'll do that for all of them. Um, and that is about it. And I think uh, I will go ahead and call it here. Uh, see me in the next one.